when I was a child, I had two near-death experiences. Um, but let me give you a little background of my childhood. So this all goes into context. So my childhood, my mom was an alcoholic and my dad was absent. And, and so I had to grow up really quickly. We were, I was one of three children. And then my mom, when she was remarried later in life, I had a, a, a stepsister as well. But I had to be an adult very early in my life. And so, um, you know, it was a really challenging childhood. My mom was dysfunctional in the sense that she was an alcoholic and she was not a nice drinker. You know, how some people get kind of friendly <laughs> when they drink. My mom was not. She she actually got really belligerent and violent. And uh, I was really afraid of my mom. So I was always, you know, the first time I had a near death experience was we had a barbecue at our house and my mom thought that if if she liked something, of course, everyone had to like it. And um, she liked watermelon, which I do not like watermelon. There's certain things I don't like. Almost everything that my mom liked, I did not like. I don't like onions. I don't like tomatoes. I don't like watermelon, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, so it, I had to eat this watermelon. So it was like this big piece of watermelon. And it had those big black seeds. So I said, okay, well, let me just get this over with. And so I just kind of crammed it in my mouth really, really fast. And I probably was around six years old at the time. And... One of the seeds, because I was a really thin little girl, because I wouldn't eat much because I didn't like my mom's food. <laughs> and it was just really stressed out. So I had this, the, it got lodged in my throat. It was like a big watermelon seed. And I, of course I couldn't breathe. And I think the adults didn't even notice until it was like turning blue and fell on the ground. And the next thing I remember is I was watching myself from above in an ambulance heading toward the hospital. And I remember there was a cord connecting this version of me that was above the ambulance and the little girl that was being taken to the hospital. And I knew that if that cord was severed, that the little girl would die. And so I said, I knew that I had to stay close to the ambulance. And it was like a really stormy day. And I just remember following the ambulance. That's all I remember about that. So that was my first near-death experience and my childhood continued on and, you know, I would frequently be woken up by my mother who would be like dragging me down the hall, typically by my hair and yelling at me because I did something wrong, whatever that might be. Um, so this one particular morning she came in and she, you know, pulled me out of bed. I was in my little Cinderella pajamas and you know, threw me in the kitchen. She was like, I told you to clean the grease on the ceiling and you hadn't done it. And I remember, um, you know, her retiring and me getting up on the, on the counter to clean this black grease spot above the stove. And I remember thinking um, about life, like really profound thoughts for such a young child that if there was good people in the world and bad people in the world, that I wanted to be good. And that gave me my first sense of, you know, self-worth. Cause I was like, oh, that means I am good, you know, cause I wanted to be good, but not to get to heaven, not to avoid hell. Cause I had heard the stories about, you know, if you're a bad little girl, you get thrown into the pit of fire. And if you're good, you go to this pearly gates and whatever, you know, it's just like such a sad moment in my in my life that I was just like, what is the meaning of life? And I started having this uh, personalized conversation with what I understood to be God. And I was, if you're real, I want to know that you're real before I die, not after. It seemed like that was cheating. <laughs> and also, could you help my mom stop drinking? Which I thought was a bigger impossibility than showing me that God was real because I just didn't think that was either possible neither of those two things. And with that thought kind of in a trance like state, I turned around and I walked off the counter. You know, have you ever imagined walking into a swimming pool with no water? Okay. That was the sensation that I had. I stepped off the counter and then your head kind of goes down. And then I started hurling towards the ground. But in that moment, this is where it gets kind of interesting. I understood, like I saw myself in three, three dimensional view. There was the me that lived in this body, the soul essence that I identified with. There was the body, which I did not identify with. And then there was this all pervasive uh, entity that was also me, the all, I call it all knowing observer. So three different parallel uh, 
versions of myself at the same time. And I found myself kind of like falling through a vortex, which I guess you could call it a tornado, but it had no sound. It was just like spinning. And it was just this gray spinning vortex. And I was going through the middle. And I remember thinking, am I actually falling down or is this going up? You know what I mean? Like there was like an optical illusion. And all of a sudden it came to a halt and I found myself out in space. It was like a serene velvet night and there were stars. And I, I remember just thinking, oh, and I got this profound knowing. First of all, I said, there's no empty space in the universe, um, which I had no idea how I knew that. And all there is is energy and those are the stars and that's what we are. I am energy. And boom, with that, I was back in my body and somehow, <laughs> kind of like a cat, I had ended up standing on my feet. So I went falling towards the ground. So of course, because we we like to, you know, kind of make sense of what's happening to us, especially at that age, I thought, well, I must have fallen and it hit my head or seen stars and somehow made it to my feet, but unconsciously, but that's what I figured it happened. So I went to the bathroom, running to the bathroom, because it was kind of like, it was this very all inspiring experience. I was, wanted to know what had happened. There was not a bruise, there was not a bump, there was not a cut. So I, I called my brother and I was like, Mark, Mark, and you know, God save me. And he's like, what? <laughs> like, again, God was not welcome in our house. And it wasn't a word that was ever thrown around or even considered. My mom said that, you know, anyone, all, all the religious people were a bunch of GD hypocrites. That was what she said about, you know, religion. So there wasn't a lot. And, and he started laughing. I started laughing, my brother. And he's like, you've lost it. Like, God saved you from what? What are you talking about? And I told him I fell out of my body. There was three of me. There was this all pervasive knowing being there was me there was this vortex and he was just laughing he's like okay and I said that's fine I said I realize it sounds even at that age I understood that this sounds very weird and I knew that the experience was exclusively for me it was a very big bedrock in my um the rest of my life because I had this experience I knew there was something more when I was out there in this space and time I felt this all pervasive love and unconditional and light and warmth and acceptance and worthiness and and union with all things and so shortly after this experience i said okay mark never forget just remember because this is going to seem like a dream someday i'm sure so every year i would say to him i was like hey mark do you remember he's like yes i remember yes i remember but my mom's uh drinking issues were getting worse and worse as typically happens right when people drink um so she was getting more and more belligerent. And so at 17, I left home. And I remember her going away speech was like, you, you don't have a family. You're going to be a whore. You're going to be a prostitute. You're you know, going to amount to nothing. I don't ever want you to call me again. I don't ever want to see you again. You're a big disappointment, which was crushing, right? Because all I wanted her to say was like, come home. But she didn't. And, you know, when you're young and um, on your own, I was so innocent. I mean, I was really used and abused by quite many, many people. I mean, my, one of my um, friend's husband showed up at my door early in the morning. We won't go into what happened, but you can imagine it was not good. And just bad stuff happened. So I was just a matter of like surviving. And I just couldn't figure out why life was so tough. So then I got married and I had two children and my husband was really quite, my first husband, quite quite a lovely man, except for he really liked women <laughs> and multiple, well, he was multiple women. So that lasted 13 years only because I didn't want to get divorced. And I had always said that I would not be my mother and I wouldn't get divorced. And of course, never say never. <laughs> so we ended up getting divorced and I felt like, you know, Cinderella, the slipper didn't fit, like the truth was out about me. The secret was out, like all my disguises had been unveiled. And, you know, I was again seen for what I really was, which was unworthy. And so that was a really hard time in my life um, being, I was alone. I was living in Dallas. I had no friends. We lived in Mexico. I moved away. 
I knew nobody here and it was just a really, really hard time. So I didn't date. I wasn't really into any of this. I just was taking care of my kids. So I remember a friend of mine that I had met at the gym and he's like, Hey, I have this house in, no, in Vail and we're going skiing, the whole family. And I was like, well, I'm not really ready for a relationship, but I'll come with you as long as my, my uh, cousin could come. And my cousin is, she was a cousin by marriage, not a true cousin, but she felt like my blood sister. And so she said, sure, I'll go with you. And she plays the clarinet or played the clarinet for the Dallas Opera. And she was very talented and beautiful. She was this loving, wonderful person. So we went on this ski trip. And this is when it gets really juicy. <laughs> this is when my whole like life started to change. Um, so we weren't having the most fun on this trip. I mean, they drank and they smoked and they cussed the whole family. We just did not fit in, you know. And so I said, you know, to her, I was like, I'm not having a whole lot of fun here. And I miss my kids and I just want to go home. And so I told him, hey, I want to leave early because I want to get home and see my kids. And it's just not a good fit for me. I don't know that I was ready to date. And I just kind of excused myself. And he said, yes, I understand. I think he was ready for me to go. <laughs> anyway, we were on our way back to the, the airport. I think he took the wrong way. Instead of going down, he went up or something to this effect. Anyway, ended up like skinny down the road. It was a blizzard, ice storm. The car is spinning around, uh, the car coming down the mountain, hit my side of the door, which crushed the door in. And in this uh, experience, I, this is when I had my near-death experience, the most poignant one that I, I'll share with you, where all of a sudden time slowed down and I recognized that um, I was about to die. I was like, oh, I didn't know I was going to die today. Like everybody in the car was screaming and and I was like this calm, like Zen person. I was like, oh, I didn't know I was going to die. And the car is being questioned. And I'm just kind of just going, oh. And then I remember looking back at my cousin. She was being thrown side to side. And her head was hitting. It was a little Jeep. So her head was hitting this side. And then her head was hitting this side. And then her head was hitting this side. This was February 23rd, 1997, by the way. A date when I will never forget. And... um I remember just having compassion and looking back over my shoulder at her. And that's when I felt real deep remorse about what was happening. Cause I thought, Oh my God, I brought her on this trip with me. And now this is what's happening to her. And then all of a sudden I was, uh, as time slowed down, I was shown my life in a three dimensional panoramic view, meaning that I saw everything forward and backwards and every single ripple effect of my every thought action out to infinium, which by the way, is just a quite a download of information all at once. I saw everything in the eternal now all at once, every possibility, every word ever, everything I've ever said, all the way into completion, which is hard to fathom, I'm sure. Not only that, I was shown multiple destinies that were probable destinies for what I could, what could possibly happen to me as a result of this car wreck. One of which I would die, another I would come back and be crippled, another I would come back and be mentally disabled. And there was all these different, there were so many, I can't even mention how many there are because there were so many. But the poignant ones were the ones where I'd come back and I saw those also in completion, like the old woman in a, in a wheelchair, the, the one that was mentally disabled and so on and so forth. And I saw my children um, growing up and being, being fine without me, which was quite surprising. <laughs> I saw their whole ripple of their life. I was shown that they would, regardless of what I chose, that each soul is here for the bliss of its own existence and that their destiny would continue on without me, which shocked me because I, I was such a mother bear. I always felt like my, my impact in my children's life was poignant and necessary. And I was shown, no, each soul's here. And it all works together for the good. So whatever happens with you. So I, I was shown that they would have children. I shall never get married, finish college, all the stuff that, that they're now doing, by the way. And I was, I was shocked. And, and then I was shown three very poignant things that I'll never forget. And the first one was I was shown that I had never really seen the sun rise or set, which, of course, I had, <laughs> and but I had never really seen it. I was always in the utilitarian sense, seeing and doing and being because I 
had to survive. It was kind of survival mode. So you saw the sun set, you saw it rise, but you never really deliciously knew the metaphor of that, like the arrival of a day, the end of the day, life expressing itself in the way that life does. And so I was shown like the opportunity just to see the, the sun rise one more time. And I was shown um, that I had, which is a really funny and poignant thing. I'd never really smelled freshly cut grass, you know, like mowed grass, which I had this overwhelming aroma. And I was shown the beauty of just like earth, you know, that, that earthy smell. Like I had never really appreciated basically being on planet earth. And then the third, which I think is the most important, is that I had never really reached out and touched someone. And of course I had. I mean, I had three children. I had six pregnancy and two children. So I had four miscarriages, in, which is, by the way, really hard on a marriage. It's one of the reasons I think that my first marriage failed. It was just a really hard marriage. But I have two you know, children as a result of those six pregnancies. And But I was shown that I had never really reached out and touched someone, like really physically touched them. You know, like I had combed their hair and sent them off to school, but not just touched their head. And because only in a physical body do we have the experience of this visceral experience of connection, which is quite delicious and quite beautiful. Like just to give someone a hug and myself as well, I've lost my mom. And just, you know, when you realize that you can never see them again and never touch them again, never hold their hand again, it's it's very odd. You know, I remember seeing my mom in the casket and it was just like this waxy body that was not my mom you know what I mean and um and just the idea that I could never reach out and and give her a hug again so I was shown these things and and I was like well it's too late now because I'm going to die and and I remember thinking well I'm going into the light was kind of the last thing I was thinking and then I was shown somehow taken to a hospital back in the this day 1997 a lot of people were still dying from AIDS. I don't remember if you if you remember that time, but people were the epidemic at that time was the AIDS epidemic. And I was shown, um, I was taken to this hospital and shown all these young, mostly young men dying of AIDS. And I'd always said, you know, like if I was ever in that kind of condition, I would just rather die. But what I was shown was the soul of these young men who were dying. They all wanted one more breath of life they wanted they were taking the nectar even of the last breath of their life and so i think all of this was shown to me so that i saw the value because i had always thought of life as a burden that i just had to be good i had to like do all the stuff that i had to do and i it was like a big heavy backpack of responsibility since a very small child and then suddenly i was shown no this is a gift each soul is here for the the joy and the bliss of its own existence including you and I was kind of shocked about the including you business. And I was like, oh, and I was like, well, it's too late now because I'm going into the light. And that's when I started. The... So apparently we fell. I was talking to Carmen, who, by the way, Carmen, my cousin, survived. And that's a really wonderful story. Um, longer story, but uh, a miraculous story, her recovery. And um, I was talking to Carmen the other day about it. And she was like, we fell 80 feet and we flipped 10 times. I thought we had, I guess we, we fell 25 feet, hit the ground. And then we went, continued on because we flipped 10 times and it was 80 feet. So we were hit by a car going 50 miles an hour. And the impact was phenomenal. And it was on my side. And then we flipped around and flew off the cliff. And then we fell 25 feet, hit the ground, flipped 10 times and went 80 feet all in total. And during that time, I think I went unconscious. I'm not sure exactly what happened. At this point, I just felt myself kind of tumbling in the darkness. It was just tumbling, tumbling, tumbling. And then when I came to, we were at the bottom of the mountain where our Jeep was upside down. The wheels were spinning. I could smell gasoline. The lights were up against the icy mountain. And I was really quite shocked that I was alive. I was like... I'm alive. And Carmen was silent or absent. I'm not sure what happened to Carmen. The guy that was driving was a bloody mess and he was just completely slumped down. And I was like, I get to see my children again. Like I'm alive. I was like, 
I'm alive. And so I crawled out the window, <laughs> climbed up this 80 foot cliff. I mean, being I'm in good shape. And then I, I got up there and people said, what ha do you know what happened? I said, there's two more people down there. And so they got, you know, the ambulance and the fire department. And, but this is where things started to get really kind of groovy. Like I, if I touched someone and I knew all their thoughts, their fears, their joys, their sorrows, their deepest secrets, which was a little overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, I knew someone was stealing my purse and I, was, I wanted my purse because that's how I had my tickets to get home and my money and my credit cards and this and that. And I saw someone with rubber boots stealing my purse, which actually did happen. And I had just bought a bunch of spiritual books. I really wanted my spiritual books. And they the spiritual books were gone and they took me to the hospital that's what I've been shown about like everyone that you pass and meet on the sacred journey of your life is meant to be in your life. 